Well, good morning and welcome to our UA at Home guided worship service. We like to remind everybody each week that this is a time to focus, even if we're in our homes, solely on worshiping God, hearing from his word, partaking in the Lord's Supper, and praying together. So we'd ask you, if you're not using your phone to watch this video, to silence it, turn it off for the duration of this service, and be focused on God. Thanks so much. Everyone, we are locked down. Hope you like Corey's red hair here. And now please join us in a time of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for each day we have been blessed with. Help us to, to be wise and thoughtful. And we pray for this church 
all the members and all the members' loved ones. Help us to find ways to help each other and to take care of one another, even as we're separated. We know that that you are with us all and that our hearts are together. Just please give us the wisdom and the strength each day to make decisions that that honor you and and lift you up and lift our church up. And Lord, just please grant us hope and and may we always have faith in in Jesus and we know that that you are in control and that you will lead us out of this difficult time and may we always seek you and and always trust in you since and now let's pray the prayer that that you taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen in church we miss you and we hope to be able to worship again with you soon today i am reading revelations 1 verses 9 through 20 
John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of, of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Last week, we began a series called What's After? And this whole series is about the afterlife. And there are a group of churches in the Austin area all preaching on this topic. Now, we didn't choose this topic in light of the virus. We had planned this all the way back in the fall. So on the one hand, this sermon series is very timely. But this sermon series and the topic that we're talking about, the afterlife, is always pertinent. It always matters to us because we're mortal. We don't live forever. Death is inevitable for all of us. So it's important for us to recognize that and ask the very serious question, is there life after death? Now, last week we talked about the story of Cain and Abel. And we talked about how God cares about life before death. Human life in God's eyes is sacred. He says when Cain kills Abel, that Abel's blood cries out to the ground from God. God views this taking of innocent human life as inherently unjust. So we are not escapists. We care about this life. We aren't so focused on heaven and the afterlife that we don't care about this life. Just because we do believe in the afterlife doesn't mean we ignore what's happening here. Christians have actually cared about human life so deeply that they've committed their lives to protecting other humans' lives. So Christians have cared for the unborn, the old, the sick, these have all been important to Christians from the beginning of life all the way to the end. We think that human life is sacred. So whatever we think about life after death, we have to care about life before death. We think life is sacred because God thinks that human life is sacred. Now, what we think about life after death is based on Christ after death. His death, Because as Christians, we root all of our faith in Christ. And we believe that Jesus, who is a rabbi who lived 2,000 years ago, died by crucifixion. We believe firmly in his death and we profess it every single week in the Apostles' Creed. But we don't think that that was the end of his story. There is more to the story of Jesus than his crucifixion. So we believe in life after death because we believe in Christ after death. Now, there are so many passages that we could explore for today, but our passage comes from the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, I know that this book can be very intimidating both to Christians and non-Christians. 
The word revelation comes from a Greek word, apocalypsis. This is where we get our word apocalypse. But it's not supposed to conjure up images of post-apocalyptic movies that come out of Hollywood. Apocalypsis means unveiling, revealing. It's about God showing something to his people. Now, from the beginning of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John says, Blessed are those who read or who hear this book. So this book is meant to bless the church, no matter what century or country the church is living in. Because just like Paul addressed his letters to very specific churches, John addresses the book of Revelation to seven specific churches. But just like Paul, John intends the whole church all over the world to read his book. So this book is not written as a strange code for us to unlock. It's not supposed to be purely mysterious. It is written to the church for us to read and listen and understand to it because it's written for us. Now, again, Revelation is not primarily just a blueprint about the future, but the unveiling of Jesus Christ. John sees Jesus throughout all of his visions. And this is the same Jesus we know from the Gospels. It's the same Jesus that Paul worshipped and wrote about. So if you're a Christian, don't worry. This is the same Jesus you know and love. But if this vision of John's is real, if John is seeing Jesus in heaven, that is crucial for us to know because that means Jesus has a story after his crucifixion. Something happened in between his crucifixion and his ascension into heaven that we need to care about. So what happened after his death? What happened next? Well, as Christians, we often focus on kind of four parts of Jesus's life. At Christmas, we love talking about the baby of Jesus. At different times during the year, we love to talk about his parables and his miracles. On Good Friday, we tend to focus on the crucifixion, and on Easter Sunday, we focus on the resurrection. But there's something really crucial that happens after the resurrection, which we call the ascension. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day after he died, and then 40 days later, he was exalted to the right hand of God. He lives and reigns in heaven, and that's what Christians have confessed for 2,000 years. So even though we don't focus on that part of the story, that's the image that John has. He has a vision of the ascended and exalted Jesus Christ. And that vision, if you care to read it, is both frightening and reassuring. So on the one hand, Jesus is depicted in, in very familiar ways. He's depicted as a king. Uh, he loves us and he frees us from our sins by his blood. God is depicted as his, as his father. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. But he's also depicted as incredibly powerful. If you listen to that chapter that we just heard this morning, you can hear the Apostle John trying his best to describe Jesus John says he, he's like, 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 like a son of man. He, he's like, like a, a king dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. His hair is like, it is like wool and, and white like the snow. You can hear in all of those comparisons, he doesn't have the adequate language to talk about this Jesus he's seeing. And he sees him as just so powerful. His eyes are like blazing fire. His feet are like hot metal, bronze gl glowing in a furnace. When he spoke, his voice sounds like rushing waters, like the Niagara Falls. He's so powerful. This vision is one of the same Jesus in the Gospels, but his power is on full display. And so John responds in fear. He says, when I saw Jesus... I fell at his feet as though dead. But then Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. 
I hold the keys of death and Hades. So after John sees Jesus, he almost, I mean, he practically passes out and Jesus has to wake him up and say, don't be afraid. And the reason why John should not be afraid is because Jesus is alive. He lived and then he died. He stayed dead, but then he was raised from the dead. He lives again, never to die again. He has conquered death. He even symbolically holds the keys to death and Hades. Now, we can't truly understand the resurrection unless we think about its uniqueness. Because what happened to Jesus is unique. It hasn't happened to anyone else. No one did what Jesus did before him. And no one has ever done it afterwards outside of his power. He is unique. He is singular without peer or any competition. And at the same time, when we think about his resurrection and ascension, it is universally significant. And I want to talk about both of these things. Now, when I say that the resurrection is unique, that's going to sound strange to some of you who are more familiar with the Bible because there are lots of resurrection stories. You've probably heard about how Elijah and Elisha both raised children from the dead. Um, you may also know about the three people who Jesus himself raised from the dead. He raised a widow's son, he raised Jairus' daughter, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. You might even know there's a story tucked away in the Gospel of Matthew that the moment when Jesus was raised from the dead, these tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people rose to life. If you continue to read the New Testament, you'll see other stories where Paul and other apostles raised people from the dead. So what about all those stories? How can Jesus be unique if all of those resurrection stories have happened throughout scripture, well, the, the difference is that those other stories were stories of resuscitation. These people lived, died, came back to life again through miraculous power from God, but then died again. They were not, in the strictest sense, raised from the dead. All of those people were resuscitated, but they weren't in the same way resurrected because Jesus lived, died, lived again to never ever die again. That's exactly what Jesus says. He says, look, I live forever and ever. And resuscitation is massively different than resurrection. It may seem like semantics or war choice, but it's a huge difference because with all those resuscitations where people died again, death still won in the end. Resuscitation means that death kind of loses temporarily, just one battle, but for Jesus, he won a war against death. Death could not hold him. That's what the apostle Peter says. Death could not hold him. Death does not have the final say on Jesus's life. But you might think, okay, who cares? It's, it's unique to him. It happened to him. But why does that resurrection for him matter to us? Well, what's important is that Christ says that if you're united to him, you can be brought back to life. You see, he won a war against death, and now he says that he has the keys to death and Hades. It's this image of Jesus ransacking death's home. He has the final say on who lives and who dies. Jesus believes that death is an enemy. We talked about that last week. Death, in, a, in, a, in a, the deepest sense possible, is an evil. And it's an, it, it's an enemy that comes after every single one of us. But Jesus has an interpretation of his resurrection, that it was a conquest and a victory over our defeated enemy. It was like a coup against the tyranny of an oppressor. What Jesus did was a revolt and a revolution 
against death. So Jesus didn't exempt himself from death. He didn't get around it. He didn't miraculously preserve himself from death. No, he died and he stayed dead. But then on the third day, he shook free of the grasp of death and Hades. And he walked out of death. It's this almost impossible to imagine kind of scenario. But that means if he has conquered death, then his death and resurrection is universally significant. He holds the keys. He decides who goes to death and who won't stay there forever. Last week, I asked the question, what if you knew you were going to live again? What if you knew that, that you didn't just live once, you lived and died and lived again? And what if you knew that that next life was permanent, permanently good or permanently bad? And what if you knew who determined the next life? Well, now you know. Jesus is the one who holds the keys to death and Hades. He has the final say on who lives and who dies. He determines the afterlife. Whoever is united to him can live again and experience the joys of heaven. But here's the thing. This is only true if Jesus actually rose from the dead. If his resurrection is a symbol, if his body is in a tomb somewhere or somewhere in a ditch, if Jesus of Nazareth is dead, then the wheels of death still turn and grind us up. Death is still the victory. Death is still our powerful enemy. Even if he was just resuscitated and eventually died, if the disciples saw a ghost or a hallucination, death has not been defeated. But if he died and if he was raised and he lives forever and ever, just like John sees in the first chapter of Revelation, then his resurrection has universal significance. You can live again. You can experience life after death. As John puts it, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. And that means all of us, we can be born out of death. It's a powerful image, but it's so important. Jesus may be the first to experience the resurrection, but he's not the last. If we're united to him, if we believe in him, if we put our trust in him, we can live again. We can be raised from the dead. And he can tell you, I hold the keys. I decide the next life. It all depends upon me. There's some beautiful art that depicts this relationship that Jesus has to death and Hades. And I think I've shown it before, but I love some of these images of Jesus walking into death and Hades and bringing people out of it. In this one, he's trampling upon death and he holds Adam's hand as if he's pulling him out. I love in this one, we see both Adam and Eve reaching out to Jesus, but their, their wrists are limp. They don't pull themselves out of death. The only one who can pull us out of death is Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lived again, never to die again. He really does have the say on the afterlife. Because we believe that Jesus' story did not end in death, we don't think our story ends in death. He has an afterlife, which means all of us who are united to him will share in that afterlife. We will experience what he experienced. So even though he was unique, even though no one did, what he did before him, all of us who come after him, who have faith in him, can experience what he experienced. He says to John, in a reassuring way, I am the living one. 
And I love that right before that, when John sees Jesus for the first time and sees him in all of his power and glory, he falls to the ground as though dead. But Jesus pulls him back up and says, yes, I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. Death has actually been defeated. Christ holds the keys to death and Hades, and he decides who gets to experience what he experienced. He has the final say, not death. So
even though we're apart, let's come together for a couple of minutes and reflect on the Lord's Supper. I'll be reading from Revelations 19, verses 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write this, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of your son. And Father, even in these uncertain times, with the stress and the not knowing what tomorrow may bring, we are so grateful for the consistency, for the anchor point in our lives of Jesus' sacrifice and remembering what that means for us. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that we can be a member of that supper. Father, we ask that you bless everyone in our church family and those across the world right now, Father, that your Holy Spirit brings us peace and an understanding that throughout whatever life brings us, you are consistent. Your son's sacrifice is consistent. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we reflect on the blood that was shed, we are so grateful for what that means for each one of us, for the hope, for everlasting life, and for the fact that we are bound together as one family. Father, we ask again for the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we ask that we reflect the love that was demonstrating in the shedding of this blood. Father, continue to walk th with us through these uncertain times and for whatever tomorrow may bring. Bless our family here at the Church of UA. In your son's name we pray, amen. We wish peace and blessings to our family at UA. There are three ways to give to the work of the church at this time. You can go to our website, www.uachurch.org. You'll see a button on the top right that says give. You can press that and give online. You can also find us at Venmo. This is an application on your phone, at UAChurch at UA Church and you can give through that app. And finally, you can mail in physical checks at 1903 University Avenue, Austin, Texas 78705. We know that so many of us are struggling right now. This is a, a call upon those who are financially stable to be generous. The work of the church continues and we're so grateful for any contribution you can give. Thanks so much. This is the part of our service where we say our confession of faith together. So I'd encourage you in your homes to say these words along with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.